The footage was grainy and unclear, of a much lower quality given what we have now come to expect from the high-tech camera-mounted drones that predominate over the eastern Ukraine battlefields. But the action was unmistakable, and the message clear. The scene was a charred checkerboard of collapsed houses and the black framework of a village grid set among snow-covered fields. Three dark grey armoured vehicles were cautiously manoeuvring against each other, engaged in a deadly game of cat and mouse amongst the ruins. One vehicle was the most powerful and heavily protected main battle tank available to the Russian army, the T-90. The two opponents were lightly armed, American-designed and built infantry fighting vehicles, the M2 Bradley. With streaks of brilliant orange flame, one of the Bradleys strikes out. Its potent chain gun spits at a rate of fire of up to 500 rounds per minute. The gunfire pummels the Russian tank, momentarily enveloping it in grey clouds and orange sparks. Some of the tank's reactive armor detonates. The Bradley retreats quickly to avoid retribution. Lingering to survey the effect of its attack would be fatal. But then a Bradley pops up again. More 25mm rounds flail the T-90. The Russian tank is wounded by the hammer blows. A large explosion of flame erupts from the front of the tank. Blinded by strikes against its optical systems, the tank staggers like a punch-drunk boxer and flails wildly. It's not managed to fire a shot at its opponents. Its turret starts to slowly spin out of control as the vehicle drives into a tree and crashes into a halt. Three very dazed and confused Russian tank crew manage to climb out of the hatches of the tank and stumble away, one of whom was captured. They were the lucky ones. A large proportion of Russian tanks suffer from catastrophic explosions when hit by anti-tank fire. Often the turrets are flung hundreds of feet into the air. But perhaps the crews of the Bradley were lucky as well. It's not recommended doctrine in any army to routinely pitch a lightly armored and armored infantry fighting vehicle against a main battle tank, even at close range. Fortunately, the T-90 had been unable to land a blow with its 125mm main armament. At the time of producing this report, 190 M2 Bradley fighting infantry vehicles have been sent to the government of Ukraine for defense against the Russian invasion. The Bradleys appear to be performing well in Ukraine, at any rate, the Ukrainian army operators of the vehicle seem very happy with them. And it's doing more or less the job it was designed and developed for, confronting a large-scale conventional assault by the Russian army in Central Europe, even if the specific circumstances of this showdown were largely unforeseen. The Bradley, along with the M1 Abrams and F-16, all pose serious threats to Vladimir Putin's assault on Ukraine. But how did an American Bradley get to be in Ukraine? And perhaps more to the point, how did a Bradley come to be anywhere? In many ways, the troubled history of the birth of the Bradley stands, above all, as a powerful lesson in how not to produce a combat vehicle. Before we can assess why it represents such a challenge to the Russian army, we need to take a look at where the Bradley came from. We need to go back to the 1950s. In the aftermath of the Second World War, armies were reappraising and re-examining concepts of armored warfare, particularly in light of new forms of mobility, but also following the arrival of nuclear weapons. Instead of vulnerable trucks and open-topped half-tracks acting simply as taxis to move troops to the battlefield, modern mechanized warfare seemed to demand the use of fully armored troop carriers, which could offer more effective and better protected options for forced deployment. And tactical doctrines were changing as well. Most of the major modern armies of the time started to develop requirements for armored vehicles that were not only protected enough to move troops straight onto the front line, but were also capable of fighting alongside the infantry, providing fire support as troops assaulted enemy positions, forming an integral part of the infantry battle. The American military were quick to field such vehicles. The M75 armored personnel carrier came out of requirements laid down in September 1945, just at the end of the Second World War. It was fielded in the early 1950s and saw operational service during the Korean War. It was expensive and not a particularly popular design, so only a thousand or so were made. Its successor was the M59, which was slightly more successful, with 6,000 made. It entered service in 1954, with production ending in 1960. It could carry 10 soldiers or a single jeep. But the big breakthrough came with the arrival of the M113 series of vehicles. It was another box-like tracked vehicle. The M75, M59, and the M113 all looked very similar, armored all over, with a heavy machine gun mounted on a commander's cupola. It entered service in 1960 and had two permanent crewmen, a driver and a commander. It could carry between 11 to 15 passengers, depending on the mission and the equipment accompanying them. And it was just in time for the Vietnam War, where it was first deployed in June 1962. 
It adapted well to the rigors of the terrain, climate, and unique demands of jungle warfare. It was also sent to West Germany as part of the US support for NATO guarding against possible Soviet attack. It was a very popular design, and over 80,000 were made, many of which are still in service to this day. It served the militaries of 50 different countries, and production only ended in 2007. The M113 was lighter and mobile, made of aluminium rather than steel. Its design made it highly versatile, and many different weapon systems could be fitted to it, including anti-tank missiles. The M113 also spawned an impressive array of other combat command and support variants. Even in the 1990s, when the Bradley had long since taken over as the frontline replacement for the M113, thousands of M113 variants remained in the American armored formations, fulfilling an invaluable number of support roles. But the basic concept of the original M113 was still very much as a battlefield taxi, with armor that could protect against small arms fire and shell splinters and no significant offensive capability beyond a machine gun. In 1967, something happened that shook the Western defense communities. A new Soviet armored vehicle was fielded. It was the BMP-1, Boyavaya Machina Piakoti, meaning infantry fighting vehicle. The design was revolutionary. It was low to the ground, tracked, and with weapons ports along both sides to allow troops to fire while protected and moving. It was designed to operate in a nuclear, biological, and chemical NBC environment, and was sufficiently armored to protect against up to 23mm caliber weapons. For weaponry, in a small two-man turret, it mounted a 73mm gun with a rail fixed on top of the gun for a SAGA anti-tank guided missile. A Kochschel 7.62mm machine gun completed the package. The Soviets had radically upped the stakes. The BMP was the vehicle that could apparently do everything, and the Arab-Israeli conflicts of the 1960s and 70s also demonstrated that the era of the small, portable anti-tank guided missile had arrived. So how did the American military respond to this challenge? The design of what would become the Bradley was to sprawl out over 16 years, beginning in 1965 and only reaching operational deployment in 1981. Its development was so problematic protracted and costly that a comedy film starring Kelsey Grammer and Richard Schiff was made in 1998 about the whole process. Requirements, technology, geopolitics, and conflicts around the world changed rapidly over this period, which spanned five American presidents. We will see here in the story of the Bradley that the vehicle that was originally asked for was not the same vehicle that was produced by the end of this lengthy and complicated process. In the early 1960s, with the M113 in service, American developers were already thinking about what its successor should look like. The original debates over the type of vehicle began in the 1960s. The US Army wanted specialized armored transportation for its soldiers, mechanized forces rather than motorized. The main requirements at the time were that it should weigh no more than 8 tons and be able to keep up with the speed of the planned new US Army main battle tank what would eventually become the M1 Abrams. The vehicle had to be armored sufficiently to protect against the Soviet 14.5mm heavy machine gun and carry a full squad of about 10 soldiers. In the latter part of the 1960s, with the arrival of the Soviet BMP-1, additional requirements were added to the list for the new American troop carrier. The BMP had several flaws, its low profile made it harder to see on the battlefield, but it was only suitable for short infantrymen. From the battlefields of Afghanistan in the 1980s to Ukraine in the 21st century, Russian infantry generally preferred to ride on top of the vehicle instead, making them highly vulnerable. But the US Army wanted something similar, something like a cross between a troop carrier and an armored combat vehicle. A prototype based on the M113 was deemed too slow and was discarded. The Army began to favor a two-man turret, a 20mm automatic cannon, and a coaxial machine gun. It should also be amphibious and still able to carry nine soldiers. There were two main options being considered. One was simply to upgrade the M113, the other was to design a new vehicle from scratch. In terms of carrying capacity, it should have three crew and be able to transport nine fully armed and equipped infantry soldiers. During the 1970s, time dragged on and costs continued to increase with little to show for the process. The Army wanted a brand new piece of equipment and continued to resist upgrading the M113. But confusion was growing as to what was actually being designed. Was it a troop carrier or a tank? More demands were made. The new vehicle should now also have firing ports on both sides, like the BMP-1. 
The Yom Kippur War in 1973 confirmed the growing importance of long-range anti-tank missiles on the modern battlefield. An anti-tank guided missile system was added to the requirements. Amidst all these additional features, concerns were now growing about cost and weight. The vehicle was getting heavier, putting at risk the requirement that it should be amphibious. A new problem emerged. At the same time as this mechanized infantry combat vehicle was being designed, the army was also developing a different armored vehicle system for the cavalry. This was to fulfill the need for the cavalry units to have a reconnaissance vehicle that had the capacity to take on Soviet armor at long range. This program was also stalling, so in 1976, the two projects, the mechanized infantry combat vehicle and the cavalry reconnaissance vehicle, were merged. The reconnaissance vehicle only wanted a crew of two plus two reconnaissance specialists together with communications equipment. For the cavalry's envisaged combat role in a NATO confrontation in Europe, anti-tank missiles were also a priority. Their vehicle would need space for up to 12 missiles. The two-man turret would help the cavalry's need to have a smaller number of people in the vehicle. The requirement for the new vehicle to be able to carry nine soldiers was reduced to seven. As a result, in 1977, the FMC Corporation was given a contract to produce two distinct types of experimental fighting vehicle models based on similar requirements, the XM-2, based on the infantry fighting vehicle, and the XM-3, based on the cavalry's reconnaissance and anti-tank needs. The cracks were starting to show in the development program. Two separate reports were ordered by Congress, one by the Army and the other by the Government Audit Office in order to evaluate the infantry fighting vehicle program. There were significant criticisms made. The vehicles were too heavy and too tall, they were complicated, there was little clear definition of how they would be employed in combat. The Government Audit Office review reported in 1978 that the vehicle, as designed, was too heavy to be amphibious. The XM-3 model was judged to be slower than the M1 battle tank it was meant to be operating alongside. Funding for the program was taken out of the defense budget for the 1979 financial year. In effect, the Bradley program had been cancelled, temporarily at least. Army officials scrambled to get the program back online. Lobbying groups worked hard. The Army made sure to officially report that the new vehicles were broadly in line with military doctrine. They also stressed that an M113 upgrade would not meet the requirements. More importantly, they also pointed out that to stop the program now and start over would be very expensive and take even longer. The project was grudgingly reinstated. In October 1978, Congress approved additional funding and finally, in December 1978, eight prototype models were delivered to the Army for trials and testing. Perhaps it's surprising that everything now went relatively smoothly after all the difficulties. The prototypes were approved in 1979, and in December that year, the experimental versions were redesignated the M2 Infantry Fighting Vehicle and the M3 Cavalry Fighting Vehicle. In February 1980, authorization was given for the vehicles to be put into full production, and in October 1981, as the vehicles entered service, they were christened the Bradley after the American Second World War General Omar Bradley. In March 1983, Four M2 variants and six M3 were handed over to the 1st Battalion of the 41st Mechanized Infantry Brigade of the 2nd Armored Division. After the best part of 20 years, the Bradley had finally arrived. So let's briefly remind ourselves of what had finally been created and what the US Army now owned, bearing in mind that it had taken 17 years from the very first requirement document in 1964 to approval for production in 1981. The outcome was certainly very different from what had been requested back in the early 1960s. It was a hybrid, a product of the need to fuse together two separate military requirements. Even though they were made of lighter aluminium armor, the basic vehicle still weighed over 25 tons, something like 13 tons heavier than the original specification. They both had a two-man turret mounting a Bushmaster 25mm autocannon with a Coakshall 7.62 machine gun. An anti-tank missile system was built onto the left side of the turret. Neither version could carry a full infantry squad. The M2, the infantry version, had a crew of three and could transport six infantry. The M3 had a crew of three and could carry two other soldiers. But how safe was the Bradley? There was another problem. Even as the Bradley was now officially accepted into service and the production lines already at full speed, another serious issue emerged that once again threatened to derail the whole project. Vehicle and crew survivability were crucial parts of the design and military philosophy of American military vehicles. 
It has to be proven that soldiers have a reasonable chance of surviving a strike against their vehicle. In order to demonstrate that the Bradley could withstand battlefield punishment, it was necessary to test this by firing a range of weapons at it. This was done at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds Ballistic Research Laboratory. Public and government concerns had already been raised about the Bradley generally, given the lengthy, costly and complex development process. Two US Air Force colonels, Colonels Boyd and Burton, had examined the weapon acquisition process and were very concerned. Colonel Burton wanted to ensure that the ability of the Bradley to withstand battle damage would be tested under the most realistic of test conditions possible, including by using weapons that significantly outmatched the armor protection that the Bradley had. Burton wanted the Bradley to be stood on a firing range, fully loaded with fuel, weapons and ammunition, with the engine running, as if in a real combat situation. He argued that this was the only credible way to assess the Bradley's survivability and casualty prevention. It became a major argument about the principles of testing. Burton's views were controversial, it was felt that it was harder to gather reliable data using Burton's methods. Burton's views were overruled and he was reassigned. As a result, Burton resigned. The heated dispute came to the attention of Congress and Burton was summoned to give his testimony. As a result, Congress ordered the live fire trials to resume, but this time with using some of the methods requested by Colonel Burton. The final results of the live fire testing appeared to vindicate Burton's views. The Government Audit Office report from February 1986 observed that they had found significant concerns about the vulnerability of the vehicle, given that it carried hundreds of rounds of 25mm ammunition and anti-tank missiles, all highly explosive if struck. This is what they said. Threat munitions that penetrate the armor and hit either the TDW missiles or the 25mm ammunition could cause a catastrophic loss of the vehicle and the entire crew. Adding to the criticality of the vehicle's survivability is the presence on board of the tow anti-tank guided missiles, which may make it a high-value target since the Bradley carries as many as nine troops, casualties in the event of a hit in its more vulnerable areas could be high. And the report was also critical of the original, less realistic, test-firing process, noting, Test conditions influence the test results, making the vehicle seem less vulnerable and the casualty rate lower than might actually be the case under combat conditions. Most of the 10 live-fire test shots were aimed to deliberately avoid striking the explosive elements of the stored ammunition. Because of these findings and the work of Colonel Burton and others, significant modifications and improvements were made to the Bradley design and layout including the vehicle suspension, the armor, and the ammunition storage. Although it's hard to judge, these changes were likely to have been responsible for saving the lives of many Bradley crew members. So how did it perform in combat? Given that the Bradley had already entered service and was deemed combat ready, it was lucky that the safety issues identified as a result of the live firings were addressed before the Bradley saw its first real combat. It was not until 10 years after the Bradley was introduced into service that this hybrid beast got the chance to show its capabilities. In 1990, Saddam Hussein, the brutal dictator of Iraq, sent his army into neighboring Kuwait. An international military coalition, led by the United States, gathered just across the border in Saudi Arabia, planning a powerful armored thrust into Iraq to repel the invasion. American armored and cavalry units would be right at the tip of the spear, confronting an Iraqi army almost entirely equipped with Soviet or Soviet-style tanks and infantry fighting vehicles. In 1989, Saudi Arabia had also invested in Bradleys and had started receiving them in 1990. The US forces in the Gulf took 2,200 Bradleys with them, with 1,730 issued to frontline units and the remaining 470 held as reserve. At this point in time, an upgrade process for the Bradley had been underway for some time. For Operation Desert Storm, about one half of the Bradleys were the M2A2 version, the latest of the time, factoring in extra survivability features. Lessons Learned In the sweeping and successful battles that followed, American armored and mechanized units plunged across the border, thrust across the desert and deep into Iraq and Kuwait. It was an expansive flanking maneuver that took the Iraqi tank and infantry divisions by surprise. But this did not mean that the Iraqis were not prepared to fight, Saddam's elite forces, the Republican Guard, were well equipped with T-72 tanks and ready to resist. 
In one example, on 26th of February 1991, in the Battle of 73 Eastings, a small, highly mobile force of American M1 Abrams and the M3 cavalry variant of the Bradley from the 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment met and defeated the Tawakalna Division of the Republican Guard and the 12th Iraqi Armored Division. The Bradleys destroyed many Iraqi armored vehicles and trucks, and even some main battle tanks. In one incident, two M3 Bradleys were credited with destroying five T-72s with their tow anti-tank missile system. The M2 and M3 Bradleys were absolutely a success story during the 1991 conflict. They had inflicted much damage on the enemy, were easy to operate, and had themselves suffered minimal losses. In fact, only three Bradleys were confirmed as destroyed by enemy fire. Surprisingly, the Bradleys accounted for more Iraqi armored vehicle kills than the Abrams. But after a full-scale conflict, it was inevitable that some lessons would be learnt about the use and performance of the Bradleys. Twenty Bradleys had been lost in total, seventeen of which had been to friendly fire. Twelve others had been damaged. It was clearly essential to improve the ability to visually identify the vehicles. Infrared identification panels and other forms of markers were fitted as a priority. A US government assessment on the performance of the Bradley and the Abrams was impressed at their performance overall, noting that other support vehicles struggled to keep up with the speed of the Abrams and Bradley-led advance, such as the M109 self-propelled artillery vehicle and the M113 support vehicles. Here is a brief extract from the 1992 report. The Bradley fighting vehicle performed well during the war, according to observations of commanders, crews, maintenance personnel, and Army after-action reports. It exhibited good reliability, lethality, mobility, and range, and crews perceived the A2 model to have good survivability. The A2 high survivability model Bradley was praised for its added engine power and maneuverability, and crews felt safer with its increased armor protection. Most of the issues raised were easy to fix, leaking radiators, poor heaters, difficulty of accessing spare parts. The friendly fire issue was more serious. The misidentification of the Bradley was partly because the desert allowed for much longer-range engagement, making targeting confusion more likely at the extreme distances involved. How did the Bradleys perform in the Second Gulf War? But in many ways, the First Gulf War was the easy one. A large coalition, large numbers of high-tech equipment fighting in a wider desert environment where military objectives and the enemy were clear and there were no highly populated areas in which to fight. In March 2003, the US Army returned to Iraq to finally remove Saddam Hussein. Again, the Bradleys formed a major part of the mechanized forces. Although the initial armored offensive met with the same fast-moving success as 1991, the military operations started to come unstuck as the troops moved into Iraq's capital city, Baghdad, and other major populated areas. Operating in a dense urban environment was much tougher. Civilian armed resistance exposed the weaknesses of the Bradley and other American tank and mechanized units. The Bradley was vulnerable to close-range attack from petrol bombs, improvised explosive devices (IEDs), and rocket-propelled grenades or RPGs. By 2006, the total losses of Bradleys was 55, with a further 700 recorded as damaged. Many were lost to IEDs and RPGs. By the end of the conflict, 150 Bradleys had been destroyed, but generally crew casualties had been light and the crews were generally able to escape from the vehicles once they'd been hit. It was a tough lesson after the relatively straightforward battles in the desert in 1991, but the lesson was definitely absorbed and another raft of improvements and upgrades were introduced, most notably with the Bradley Urban Survival Kit package that came out in 2008. The BUSC program was designed to be easy to fit by troops in a battlefield environment with a minimum of additional work. It included such enhancements as a powerful spotlight, protection for external optical devices, an additional machine gun fitting for protection against close-in threats, and protection from IED and mine explosions. By the conclusion of the Second Gulf War and the insurgency in Iraq, the Bradley was well over a quarter of a century old. As well as with Bradley's predecessor, the M113, discussions of a replacement had started soon after the Bradley had been fielded in the 1980s. During the Second World War, America's industrial power was critical to winning the war. In such an extreme situation, it was possible to get a new tank, ship, or aircraft from the drawing board to frontline service in the space of two years, sometimes even less. Until there is a major shooting war, finances will always be directed elsewhere, and military priorities often have to take a back seat. So many weapons programs were downsized or cancelled after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Suddenly it seemed as if there was no enemy left to fight. Later in the 1990s, new programs for future infantry fighting vehicles did not get very far. 
The Future Combat System Manned Ground Vehicles program, established in 1999, was intended to look at a new family of 18-ton lightweight tracked vehicles. It was cancelled in 2009 due to funding shortages. In 2010, another project, the Ground Combat Vehicle Program, looked at options for replacing the Bradley. It evaluated two proposals, but both were dismissed as too heavy. One model weighed as much as 70 tons. That project was also cut in 2014 due to budget restrictions. 2018 Net Generation Combat Vehicle Program was also looking to replace the Bradley M2. In 2018, this program was renamed the Optionally Manned Fighting Vehicle Program, but for many companies interested in designing a Bradley successor, this program required companies to spend a lot of their own money up front. Some companies dropped out as a result. However, the program was restarted in 2020, with more government money available. In theory, a new combat vehicle, currently designated the XM30 MICV, will be fielded in 2029. If the Bradley had turned out to be a poor performer, perhaps the replacement programs would have swung into gear more quickly. Ultimately, the M2 and M3 versions of the Bradley still appear to be doing a good job, with crews and generals alike all equally happy with the weapon system. It looks as if the Bradley, like its close colleague the M1 Abrams, will be around for another decade or two, as long as upgrade packages are able to protect and enhance against current and future threats. So how did a US Bradley come to be in Ukraine? The Russian invasion of Ukraine began in 2014, with the seizure of Crimea and Russian forces, in the guise of local separatists, moved into eastern Ukraine. In February 2022, the situation dramatically escalated, with a full-scale Russian combined arms, air, sea and ground attack on Ukraine. After initial gains, much of the Russian advance was thrown back, amid massive Russian casualties. The international community rushed to send military and humanitarian aid. Much of the initial support was for defensive purposes, such as body armor, helmets, medical equipment, and military rations. But hundreds of armored vehicles, artillery and missiles, together with millions of rounds of small arms and artillery ammunition, were later sent. The Ukrainian government have been calling loudly for American weapon systems. The M1 Abrams main battle tank, the F-16 jet fighter, and the Bradley infantry fighting vehicle are all top priorities. In January 2023, the White House announced that it would send Bradley M2 vehicles to Ukraine for use by the Ukrainian army. 31 M1 Abrams tanks were also sent. By the summer of 2023, 190 Bradleys had been delivered to Ukraine. They were in time for the anticipated Ukrainian June counteroffensive against Russian positions. These attacks, it's fair to say, did not go well. The Russians made use of extensive minefields and artillery. Reconnaissance and strike drones proliferate across the battlefield, making troop buildups, tactical movement, and surprise attacks very difficult for either side. A much publicized photograph from a Ukrainian attack on 8th of June showed a bunched up group of knocked out and abandoned Bradleys, alongside a German Leopard Mark II. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry claimed in July that two Russian T 72s had been knocked out by tow armed Bradleys. But inevitably, the vehicle losses started to add up in such a high-intensity combat environment. By December 2023, 62 Bradleys were confirmed as either destroyed, damaged, abandoned, and even one Bradley captured by the Russians. Despite these disappointments, it does not suggest that the Bradleys are failing on this battlefield, and the Ukrainian soldiers that operate them are full of praise for their new American war machines. In particular, they singled out the strong survivability of the Bradley. The crews are adamant that the M2 can shrug off hits that would cause the Russian BMP-2s and 3s to disintegrate. The Bradleys can take a lot of punishment. In June 2023, ABC News interviewed two Ukrainian Bradley crew members after they had been hit by Russian weapons. We were hit multiple times, Andriy, who drove one Bradley, said. Thanks to it, I am standing here now. If we were using some Soviet armored personnel carrier, we would all probably be dead after the first hit. It's a perfect vehicle. Conclusions The Bradley had a very troubled and protracted development process, spanning three decades. On two occasions, the program was in real danger of being cancelled. It's a curious hybrid, a jack-of-all-trades, doing a little bit of everything – infantry fighting vehicle, reconnaissance and tank killer. Many major modifications and improvements had to be made after it entered service. The procurement process was mocked by Hollywood. But despite everything, the Bradley M2 and M3 combat vehicles have proven to be very credible and capable pieces of combat equipment that have stood the test of time. As we heard it directly from a crew member in Ukraine this year, it's a perfect vehicle. If the action by the Ukrainian 47th Mechanized Brigade at Stepova on 12 January shows us anything, it demonstrates the increasing confidence that the Ukrainian military now have in the Bradley. 
They are comfortable with it and like it. They can even take on the best battle tanks that the Russians have. And with increasing familiarity, the Ukrainian Bradley crews will only get better at adapting this potent, multi-purpose weapon system for confronting and defeating the Russian army. We will never know what Vladimir Putin really thinks about the arrival of the Bradley onto the battlefield, and the Russian army does not seem to place the survivability of its armored vehicle crews as a priority, but he must surely be very worried if the Ukrainians are happy with the Bradley. There are thousands more where this came from. But what do you think about the Bradley and its role in the Ukraine conflict? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.